With me there is Cameron, he is our technology strategist for North America. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Federica for the new ones. I'm the project manager for the containers team at SUSE. We take care of Docker and also the Kubernetes part. And today we would like to yeah, have a discussion with you or possibly also a conversation about microservices, what, what this is all about, what our takes is, and yeah, basically just to give an idea on um, is this a buzzword? Is this a technology trend? What the, the, the status on, on the topic is going to be? So, yeah, I mean, if you want it or not, microservices are something that have been around in the last two years, basically everywhere. Uh, you heard about them in blogs, interviews, um, associated to new technology products that have been released. And there is, yeah, basically no way around it. But the interesting part is that there is always very little meat attached to this bone. So everyone's talking about microservices, but what this is all about is almost never explained or yeah, very vaguely set up. Yeah, you just take your things, you split them up, and yeah, you have a microservice. And that's pretty much it. So what we would like to do in this session is try to go a bit more into the characteristics that those microservices have and see if it's something that may be an idea interesting for you and if there is anything that you can take and bring back to your own companies and decide that maybe, yeah, okay, this is something that we could take in consideration. And did you have the clicker? <laughs> right there. All right. <laughs> so, well, microservices is something that you can't really just go to your developers and say, okay, you please do things a bit differently and then everyone's set. Um, it's a topic that may require a bit more preparation and it may require a bit more changes that are often enough not considered. Changes that may go so deep as looking at all the processes that your company has, the way in which your teams are set up, the way in which the work is handled and who does what. And just trying to change this from a software perspective is definitely not going to be enough. You can try to do that, that's for sure but you would probably just limit yourself and take only a little bit of what this could actually give you. Um, we are not trying to say that microservices are the answer for everything. That's absolutely not the case. Uh, but we believe that there are a few ideas here and there that could be reused by anyone in this audience and at least to be good food for thoughts. That's pretty much... You can kind of think of it as, <clears throat> as another, another way to look at uh, your journey towards containerization as well, because that's some of the underlying technology here that's, that's, right. that's being used. I mean, if you try to look for a definition, probably, let's see if it's still visible with this template. Yeah, that would be something similar to that. So we can say there is a functional system decomposition into manageable and independently deployable components. If I would be in Europe by now, probably I would see, yeah, rotten tomatoes flying towards me because this definition is definitely not easy. It's, yeah, something that you may try to understand, you may try to grasp, you may try to apply, but it's not really saying much. Regarding microservices, what uh, it's perhaps a different and maybe a bit more useful approach is to look into what people have been doing in those years. Try to get a list of the common characteristics that I've been using and try to work from there. So a microservice doesn't necessarily have to have all of those characteristics, but the idea is what people are doing, what has been called a microservice so far, tends to have the majority of those characteristics built in. And this is perhaps a better way of looking at it more than try to stick to a definition and, you know, give that assumption and just stay with it. The list, as you can see on the bottom, there is a link. It, the list is not mine. Um, it's taken from an article from Martin Fowler. That's a very nice article about microservices. So if any one of you is interested in reading more on the topic, I would definitely suggest you to go and have a look at the address after the presentation or in the next days. So one of the best way, or at least one of the easiest way, to explain what a microservices is, is perhaps to compare it with a monolith. That is a concept that we are all pretty much familiar with. That's the, well, the way in which applications have been built in the last 20 years. Um, it's pretty much nothing really abstract. So let's, stay in, let's take, for example, an application um, very common in enterprise. So we have um, 
client UI, we have a database and we have, for example, a server side component. In this case, we would take the server side component as the example of our monolith. Um, yeah, I mean, basically you have everything built in. You have uh, the, let's say, ability of deploying this application whenever you wanted, but it's also true that as soon as you have to change anything, because maybe you have an update for a library that you need to perform, you will have to take this very application and basically rebuild it and redeploy it completely, simply because you cannot take the, an assumption that everything is going to work even if you change the smallest part of it. It's true that you can develop this application in a way which is more modularized and you can try to avoid this interference of the various components within, but over time, with passing it around with different developers, those boundaries that are not really imposed tends to disappear a little. So you can hardly make any assumption on having this application parts completely separated and completely independent. So every single time you want to do something, you better retest the entire thing altogether. And yeah, sorry, I skipped my wonderful picture about this. Uh, from the other side, you also have a problem of, in terms of uh, resources, simply because while you can scale something like this by simply adding another one next to it, so scale it horizontally and just putting everything behind a load balancer, uh, you are actually scaling things that you don't necessarily need. So basically you have to duplicate, help me, native speaker, more than duplicate. <laughs> Multiply many Mult times. Multiply, that's a good word for it, sure. <laughs> All right, so exactly the same application over and over. And yes, that works, but you know, especially when people started going towards the cloud, when resources got a bit more important to take care of, all those limitations started becoming frustrations. And this is basically what is behind the idea of microservices. The thing is, microservices is nothing more than an answer to those kind of common problems that people had with a monolithic application when they were actually working with it. So we have, um, as I said, answers for those specific problems. That is basically nothing more than taking everything that you had in your monolithic application and separate it into units of work. This means um, a service itself doesn't necessarily have to be a single process. Um, this could be actually more than that. But the idea is to have something that is able to work together as small as possible. And this also allows you to, well, basically mix things up. So for example, if you want to split your application into different kind of technologies, different languages, because maybe one language will be more appropriate for that specific service, you're not tied anymore into having to use the very same for the whole application. And also allows you to decouple all kind of needs that you may have and distribute that across. And that's basically the concept that goes uh, behind the terms of um, services as components. So you may see components as libraries, for example, but that's not exactly what we're talking about. This is because, well, a library is still tight with all the rest that is in the application. So you may have multiple libraries with dependencies on each other, and in that case, you're not really solving much if you're calculating your li this library to be your, um, yeah, your component. So what we would like to look at is something slightly different. So you would get something that is able to work on its own. So let's take, for example, the, so in hardware, for example, if you want to change your disk, you don't really care about what the situation of your CPU or, or of your RAM is. You just take the disk out, you're able to upgrade it, you're able to change it, and then put it back on a new one, and that's still working. And this is not the same that you can do if you're just taking a small piece from your application. What you need is a block in your application that you can actually take out from the whole, update, replace, do whatever you need, put it back, and the whole still needs to work. And you definitely don't have to retest the entire thing. You just have to look at the very small component that you did, make sure that the input and the output is the same as what is expected, and then the rest is still going to work. This is, yeah, basically the main aim of this is try to minimize the dependencies and to let you be able to react in a slightly more comfortable way to any kind of modifications you may want to have in the application. So 
yeah, as I said, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that this application service must have only one single runtime process. You can basically couple things together as long as it makes sense. You may have a small application, for example, with a database that is only used by that application. In that case, it makes sense to bundle them together because you know that they are tightly coupled. Um, in other cases, you would just have <clears throat> the uh, one service per process idea as it is, for example, with application containers. And the interesting part about this is that if you're looking at orchestration solutions like Kubernetes, you would see that this concept is actually mirrored in the architecture that they have. So for example, in Kubernetes, the smallest unit of work is a pod. And what we're trying to say here, it's exactly the same. So basically, we will have the pod and not the container itself, simply because the container on its own is probably useless. Well, what you need is a pod that gives you a specific service. And that's, yeah, one of the advantages you would have doing that. But, yeah. So someone in the 67, if I'm not mistaken, um, mentioned this rule that is scaringly still very, very, um, yeah, true. That means if you take uh, a group of people that are working together in the classic enterprise environment, so let's say, I don't know, a group of sysadmin, uh, DBAs, or UI, UX, doesn't really matter what. The thing is, companies tend to be split into uh, business logic. And those people are going to work on specific technologies with very little interaction with each other. This is not necessarily a bad thing, because often enough there were some, um, let's say, restrictions in what those people could do and couldn't do. So it's actually a logical way of grouping people. The problem that you have is though, once you have a monolithic application in which all those people are involved into, as soon as you have to, once again, do any change, you basically have to trigger the whole company in order to react to that change. So you may have your developers doing something, but then you have to pass the ball to the next department and to the next group of people, and this is uh, quite time money consuming, and often enough uh, comes with quite a certain level of bureaucracy connected to that. Your, your business is tied to that monolithic application. Exactly. <clears throat> so basically, uh, one, and this is part of the law that was just there before, is that people tend to overcome those kind of burdens by tailoring the application to the structure of their company. So they're going to try to find a workaround, a way of making their work easier, a way of superseding those kind of processes that are in place in a way in which is more comfortable for them to work with. Uh, but this is not necessarily what you have to have reflected in the application that you have in the end. One way of looking at this in a slightly different way would be what we have with the microservices. That means you would actually create a team composed by different roles, people that can handle the full stack. That is, it may sound like a lot, but if you just get the right people for the right job, in that case, you're going to be able to split things up a bit, and those people are going to be able to work completely independently from each other. So all the other groups are going to have a clear idea of what this group of people needs to provide to the others, but then those groups are basically self-organized and self-capable of making their own decision. This means also the reaction time that they have to any kind of problem is going to be very, very different compared to yeah, basically trigger the whole organization because you need to do an update to, I don't know, SSL or something like that. And this is actually quite interesting because there are several companies that are already starting to arrange things in, uh, in a different way, so following this kind of scheme. But this is also why I mentioned at the very beginning that it's not just a matter of saying to the developer, please split, split your code and let's make something smaller and then that's it. You also have to consider the fact that you may need to rearrange the people, you may need to rearrange the processes, and the entire life cycle of your application within the company, if you want to at least get the most out of it. Generally, you can also do a um, cross-function team within a monolith application, but you have a problem. That is, if you try to put all the people that are really involved in that, in the monolith, basically you have a huge amount of people, and basically you have chaos again. So yes, you can try to milden the situation a little bit, but still it's going to be quite complicated to have a cross-functional team that is actually still functional if you're putting too many people in with too many responsibilities and too much involvement in too many things. 
Um, this is a very nice quote of the way in which Amazon is doing things. That is, you build, you run it. What this means is mainly that there is a full ownership of what the developers have from the very beginning to the very end. This means those developers are not just developing the code for you know, finishing the project, so there is no check mark at the end of the project in which then this is given to, I don't know, the maintenance team or anyone else, and they can start on something else. They keep responsibility, full responsibility on the product until the very end. This also means that they are given, yeah, support duties at times. Maybe not the full support responsibilities, but they are still tightly coupled into the organization, in the support organization. And you may think it's a waste of energy from developers to just, you know, sit there and answer to the users. But this is actually something that it's able to give them also an idea of how is their software behaving in production afterwards. This is a way of, yeah, having a relationship, having a bond, a specific bond with their users. And that's one of the very few ways in which the developers are still able to understand how the software, if what they did is the right thing, maybe they need to react to that and change some features that are in that. But if they don't get that direct feedback, it's very, very hard to obtain something like that. So, I mean, obviously you can still, I mean, one group of people doing a project, handing it over, and then it's the problem of those people trying to adjust it to the real needs. But it's much more effective if the same people actually gain the understanding of what it's supposed to be all about. And it's very hard to do this without such a very small cross-functional team that is able to yeah, jump in throughout the entire life of the product. <clears throat> and this is everything that I said so far may sound maybe weird, may sound maybe new, may sound maybe impossible to achieve in uh, nowadays enterprise. That's one way of looking at it. From the other side, what I'm saying so far is not very different from something we are all very familiar with. That is, if I have, um, I don't know, some data and I want to format this data in a specific way and get a specific output, in Unix, what, what would I do? I would just get all this data, pipe that through different commands, and get exactly the output that I wanted. And I'm not doing something that is much different than that. It's maybe oversimplifying though, but it's basically the type of approach that we are trying to have here, up to some different levels. I already see heads shaking here, but okay. And last, yeah. Sorry, I was going to ask a question. Yeah. The challenge of this, of course, this concept is that <coughs> if you're going to break up your your functions, mm -hmm. there has to be some way for these to intercommunicate, right? right to pass mm -hmm. you know, states and things between themselves. So you're yeah. adding a, a, a layer or a level of of, um, of overhead in terms, at least in terms of messaging layer. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is correct. So basically, if you would try to get your monolith and just split it into chunks, keeping the messaging exactly as it is, and I'm talking both about the application and the people behind that, obviously, what you get is a very noisy and chatty type of conversation, simply because the type of communication that was used in a monolith is very different from the one that you should use into a microservice. And the point here is, this is the trickiest part in order to do a conversion or a passage from one to the other. And is that you definitely need to look at the way in which those services are communicated and you need to simplify that. Microservices usually are using REST APIs or other kind of web-oriented technologies that are much coarser than the communication that is usually taking place into a monolith. And yes, this is actually the heavy lifting part. If you want to really convert an application, then you have to definitely simplify the level of noise, you have to simplify the type of messaging that is passing through, and you have to readapt all that part, so to make sure that you basically have smart endpoints and dump pipes. So that all intelligence is basically taking, ca taking care of somewhere else apart from the messaging, and the only thing that you are sending in and out is just what you need to know and nothing else. And then it's up to the endpoints to apply the intelligence that they want and turn this into the result that you want. And this actually, I would say that, let me pass the, the word to you. The governance. Exactly. <clears throat> sure.
So just because you can doesn't mean you should. <clears throat> or maybe you should change it, <laughs> um, which is kind of a little bit of a plea to, um, to innovate a little bit in the space because there may be some things that in the future may change and there may be some new innovations that come about when it comes to microservices. <clears throat> We have centralized governance. <laughs> Basically says that <clears throat> you are following the way of your corporate strategy. And you have been doing that for years and years. And you're standardizing on a set of technology that you've been using. And that set of technology has been something that's kind of grown with you. Uh, kind of one example that, that popped in my mind was uh, a conversation I had with my brother. He's a developer and uh, he went to work for a new company and got so frustrated um, by the processes and by the lack of new technology and use of tools that uh, after a year's time he ended up leaving the company <laughs> because he couldn't use some new stuff and they were stuck with all the uh, the monolithic applications that they were that they had used for years and years and years and never would change anything. Um, so that would be really frustrating. So you're you're stuck uh, with these old old ideas where it doesn't give you flexibility, doesn't give you the ability to to innovate and to be creative. Um, <clears throat> didn't really have any fun there. Um, so that really only makes your life miserable. Although, um, oops, going too fast. <laughs> um, so this idea here um, with the, <laughs> um, the tool there, the hammer and the nail, is basically using the right tool for the right job making sure uh, you know, that you're using the right tool. Um, it may not be an application or a tool that you're using in your environment today, in your enterprise. It could be something that's open source that you really haven't looked at yet or haven't explored yet. Um, so make, make sure that you're using the right tool to do the right job. And I mean, especially regarding microservices, you should really think about if that's what you need. Um, as I said, I am in the containers team and what we do is basically containers orchestration and everything that goes in that direction. But I'm never going to suggest to any one of you to use containers for something in which containers are not supposed to be the right use case. And I guess that this is also part of what you're saying and other way around. Absolutely. So think about the kind of application you have. Think about where you would like to be and what you would like to achieve and then based on that you can make a decision if microservices in this specific case are something for you or if you should just keep going for what you have already in place. Yep. <clears throat> so become decentralized, essentially. Um, and that's what we're getting at here, taking that monolith and splitting up into many different services. Um, so a new approach to the way that you had your old applications working. Um, maybe it's a new language. Uh, maybe there's a UI that needs to be refreshed. Um, something that gives you a lot more flexibility going forward where you can make these small changes uh, in the application, um, either introducing a new language that can give you uh, added functionality. Um, maybe it's for your UI. Maybe it's for uh, communication back to a different database, um, whatever that might be. Um, so you can isolate things like reporting, um, isolate uh, um, other types of services with, within your application. Basically putting those into different, um, different pods, as uh, Federico was, was mentioning earlier. And most importantly, you can, once you have something like this in place, what you can do is to actually try to get the best technology for what you're trying to achieve. So you're basically losing the dependency that all those blocks have together and just try to concentrate on what exactly this single block, what do I want this block to do, and take the best tools for the job without being concerned about 
having those blocks interfering with each other or being limited by technology choices that are necessary for the other blocks. So enter open source. Now this is going to allow us to have flexibility and some innovation and allow you to be a little bit more creative uh, with your applications. Um, it's becoming more and more common today uh, in the enterprise that we see open source being adopted. Um, for our own internal development, uh, we can use internally developed tools. Many of the customers which I visit today, they develop their own tools to automate things, uh, to package things up, uh, to do various things to accomplish the tasks that they're trying to, to complete. Um, a lot of these tools can be shared in the open source world. Um, others may, be, may utilize them uh, either within your organization. Some of them you know, open source those tools as well. Um, and then, of course, um, you can slightly modify them. Just like the tools that you see here in the picture, um, no tools are the same. Some of them do the same things, but they might be different. Uh, in some regard and might add a different functionality or it might add some other type of ease of use uh, for that user. <clears throat> so a little more on open source. Um, the Amazon way. You build it, you run it uh, is one capability. Netflix, um, that's really kind of an incentive really with Netflix to Make sure your code is good quality code, um, because you don't want to be, you don't want to wake up at three in the three a.m. in the morning, and have to fix your code. So there's a bit of an incentive there to make sure your code is is good code. Make sure that it doesn't break. Um, and so there's some things that uh, that they've done there at Netflix to uh, design to basically design that into their microservices architecture, so that uh, they can ensure that their code is not going to break at 3 a.m. in the morning. <clears throat> and it's also a very good way to, if you want, for example, to test a new feature, let's say. So you're not quite sure if something is going to work. Let's say, let's say you want to change something in the UI that is exposed to the users, but you don't really know if that's a good thing to do. So with the microservices approach and yeah, everything that comes with it, it's very easy to quickly test if the change that you want to do is something that you want to keep or not, and if that's not the case, it's very easy also to take it away and replug the previous component that was giving you the old interface. So this also allows you much of flexibility in terms of trying new things without breaking all the rest. So you may want to be experimental on one side, but you know not too much. So you don't necessarily want to give out a whole new application just to make sure that the user maybe may like this button of this color or with this other label. In that, in that case, basically, it's just a matter of swapping two little pieces of the system, and everything is still going to be exactly as you left it. Yep. Um, and then Walmart uh, is kind of an interesting case there, too. They've taken their internal tools. Um, these tools are used specifically to integrate with multiple cloud environments um, and allows them to scale their applications across multiple environments throughout their, organ their entire organization. And they've called that OneOps, and they've open sourced that. It's a tool that you can pick up today and use uh, within your own environment. Um, so this, this sharing of open source code is becoming quite common. Um, Netflix has a lot of their stuff out on netflix.github.io, uh, where you can grab their, their code. Um, <clears throat> another piece on this open source and this moving toward a services architecture is, is giving the developers a little bit more responsibility over this environment that, that they're creating. Um, it tends to lead that into uh, where the developer is actually kind of doing the administration of that environment. So it's a little bit different, uh, uh, different approach from the monolithic application. Um, <clears throat> So what about your data? So we're going to abstract a little bit away from just the, uh, the service itself and then move down the stack into, into talking a little bit about uh, what happens to your data in this, uh, this services approach. 
So monolithic uh, versus a microservices approach. Um, when you take a look at the monolith, you really follow closely to your corporate standards. You might have a common set of databases within your environment, like DB2 or Oracle or, or um, some other type of enterprise database um, that everybody is either using or maybe you're adding more databases to it and it's just growing. Um, not really separated at all. Um, and it's running a lot of your common applications and services. If you look into a microservices approach, we're taking that and we're kind of splitting that up um, to get either better performance, better capabilities possibly, uh, to extend your application in ways you couldn't before. Um, <clears throat> in the monolithic uh, data approach, um, I think I just went over this actually. <laughs> um, yeah, just a screenshot to show to show that um, microservices data. Um, one thing in the microservices approach uh, to to data is that it gives you flexibility to choose what kind of data output that you really want uh, your data to be um, shoved into, whether it be a database, whether it be um, you know, some other type of system that you're connecting to. Maybe it's for logging uh, for your application or your service. Um, maybe it's a, a messaging queue. Uh, maybe it's one that fits really well with microservices today is zero MQ uh, as a messaging layer um, because it fits all the characteristics of a, of a microservice um, and it allows you the flexibility to, to plug into um, the various types of data. It has the ability to have different types of protocols. Uh, different programming languages can plug into it, um, giving you the, a lot of flexibility uh, for your entire microservices um, architecture. And that's something that it's a bit of also an answer what he was asking before. So that's done in a that's way right. in which the transmission is basically considered to be the vulnerable part. So what you have there is trying to make sure, I mean, you're not supposed to have this always there highly performant communication between the two pieces, the, the software is born with that in mind because they know that that's exactly the boundary in which you could easily break in that could not be there maybe for a few seconds because, I don't know, you're maybe migrating your entire things in another data center and that's built with that in mind. So that's what I meant with the communication and the protocols you use with that definitely needs to be tuned in order to support the entire thing and if you would just apply one-to-one -one what you had then it would break because obviously you are not anymore on the same system. Yep. So, yep. I don't know if you want to take that or <laughs> I, I can take okay. So, I'll add a couple of things and you okay. can add a couple of things. Are, are you having that problem today in your environment? <laughs> With the, okay. <laughs> um, so, with the, the application, um, you know, taking that statically, you know, compiled application, um, you can move that more into something with, like with our open build service to take advantage of um, shared libraries and things of that nature um, so that it can fit with your enterprise OS. Um, if that is kind of the case, I'm not sure what kind of application it is, but um, the open build service is limited in some cases for some languages like Java. Um, you know, we can't do any compilation of, of a lot of Java code there, but um, uh, uh, it really all depends on, on the application, I suppose. But um, uh, even splitting that up into a services architecture will, will give you 
a greater flexibility even for that type of an application because you can isolate that case. Um, you can isolate that service. If it is a statically linked application, um, you can isolate it so that it's in its own little world, right? So that is true, but it's also true that you can work at least partially around that. That means um, what we're trying to say here is not that you don't need policies anymore. It doesn't mean that you can start downloading things around and magically everything is going to be safe because containers are containing or something like that. That's absolutely not the case. So the same carefulness that you had before still has to stay there. Obviously, some things will have to change around that because it's a different scenario simply, but you still need to take care of that. So regarding, for example, the container example that you made, I mean, honestly, I would not let anyone run a container if they're not providing me a Docker file and this is built. So, so, so I, I would. If you give me a Docker file, so I'm saying you're asking, right? You give me a Docker file and I deploy your Ruby container image. I don't know what that is. I just, I compiled it, I ran it, I went awesome, it run, I stuffed it up because I'm awesome, hope to keep it up and get it out there. Um, at which point somebody comes around later and says, hey, which of your containers have a vulnerable version of OpenSSL? I go, take a bite now after this. Um, or I start looking at them and going, oh, all of them, and they're all different. I don't know what's what anymore. And I, how do I pass them to things? Why can't I just do yeah. it? So, so this is a problem with you know, organize, organization of your containers, <laughs> organizing who's actually touching them um, and who's managing those containers themselves. Um, I mean, there are, for example, already tools, I don't know if you ever heard of Claire, that is already able to do anyway some sort of scanning that is not going to be precise 100%, so probably you're going to have more false positive than what you wanted to have, but that's already an indication. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, for example, what we're doing with uh, Zipper Docker. That's one way of... No, so basically what we do there, but that's, let's say, from a different perspective. So what we do with Zipper Docker, do you actually have any slides on this? No, I don't. Okay. Um, what we're doing there is basically is to rely on the RPMs that we have within the images. So basically what we know is that if an image contains that RPM, it's going to be just as vulnerable as a normal virtual machine that has that RPM installed. With Zipper Docker, we are basically able to, well, check which containers are affected by that specific problem. That can be just a plain update. You could search, for example, for a specific CV, and then you will get the list of all the containers running on the host affected by that specific vulnerability. In that case, you could basically rebuild and send them on. But it's also true that this is um, a single hosting, and I would suggest to do, to do this not on the machine that is running those containers, but a more automatic way. So you want to make sure that on your registry there is always the latest up-to-date container that is used as a base, and then your application is rebuilt on top of that on a daily base eventually. So given that capability, your approach would be to basically limit things to uh, containers that only ship with good stable RPMs and not allow people to just roll or random <laughs> Um, I'm saying that your sources should be trusted. I mean, if that's not if that's not the case, then I mean, it can be anything. Obviously, if you have a third-party software in a container, there is not much you can do. But in that case, you are trusting the, the, the third-party vendor to provide updates and fixes. Absolutely not worried about third parties. I'm worried about the software. Right. So in that yeah. case, I mean, you can have policies in which your developers, yes, can use Docker, can use the latest, the greatest, but still they have to use certified and checked sources, RPMs, or whatever else that they want to, to use. I mean, obviously, there has to be some checks somewhere. So, so back to the tools that I was talking about earlier, right? There's, there's other tools out there. And SUSE has some tools also to address some of those deficiencies you're talking about there, too. And we'll talk about those in, a little, in just a little bit. <clears throat> So a little bit on continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, this is really the foundation um, to the microservices approach. <clears throat> you compile your application, you test it, run it, 
run it on the build machine, deploy it, deploy it on the build machine, okay, integration testing, performance testing, lots and lots of testing, and then you run it into production, right? But who has time all, uh, to do all that, especially in a manual fashion? <clears throat> Hopefully you're automating everything at this point. Um, at this point, we want to be able to develop, build, test, and deploy. So this, hopefully this can answer some of your questions. Um, this, is just, this is not, I'm not putting this up here to say oh, this is how you have to do it. This is just an example, okay? And it's got some things in there that are, um, <coughs> that are SUSE tools specifically. Some of these tools are free tools, and uh, um, some of these are built right into SUSE Linux Enterprise, um, and will come with your subscription. But this will give you, from left to right, your, the tools that you use there commonly for development, your build environment from the open build service, um, Kiwi to help build uh, your packages into an image format, which then, then can be deployed out onto a KVM or Zen or a public cloud or a private cloud with OpenStack. Um, <clears throat> so this is just one method, right? Um, so with microservices, you'll probably want to start small. You probably want to start with a small application and, uh, and then grow from there. Um, you don't want to start with this. You don't want to start with um, an architecture with your microservices that is uh, really complex. Um, you might start with pieces and parts of this, um, but uh, um, you certainly want to keep it small, uh, keep your, your, your tools and everything else small. Netflix didn't start this way. <laughs> They built all these tools out through, throughout time, and they built tools to counteract certain things and make sure that they were testing things properly um, before it hit their customers. So let's make deployment boring. Continuous delivery, that's really what it's all about, is really making delivery really boring. <laughs> um, automating things. Um, in, a, in a monolithic approach, um, the landscape there can be entirely different than a services landscape when, you, when it comes to automation. Um, with, uh, with monoliths, you have multiple modules within the, same, um, within the same monolith that are same processes working together um, in a... Um, you know, services deployment, you might have those things split up. And so uh, when, you're, when you're automating the, the deployment, um, the approach is going to be entirely different. So what about failures? Well, I talked a little bit about Netflix, and this is where tools come in. Um, the Simeon Army from Netflix uh, kind of helped them uh, to mitigate some of the failures or to actually ingest failures into uh, their environment so they could capture uh, problems before they actually came up. Um, then of course real-time monitoring. You want to have that ability to monitor your environment in real time. And, um, and service management. Um, starting and stopping and restarting of these services that you have deployed out there, um, you need to have a framework around that, an automation framework wrapped around that. And there's tools that you'll learn about throughout the entire week which can help you with a lot of these things. So where do I start? You start with designing it. And this is talking with your teams, um, setting up change controls, um, getting away from the monolith monolithic application that is tied to your processes within your organization. Um, decoupling from that, learning about some new tools that can help you um, separate yourself and begin to separate that application out into a services architecture. 
pardon me for going to interrupt you with this. Yes. <clears throat> Whenever you're talking to your teams, apart from all those definitely valid points that Kamal mentioned, ask them for what their pains are or what may bring them to change the way in which they're doing things. Because that's going to be probably one of the biggest strengths that you can rely on. If they have a problem and they want to change that, that's going to be something that's useful for you that you should take in consideration in implementing anything or designing anything new that you may want, want to have tomorrow, basically. Yeah, so just like the gentleman in the back, I mean, that's a perfect start. Asking questions, right? Learning about the new tools. Um, not quite familiar with some of the tools yet, but you're going to find out some new tools this week um, that can help you with that. So are microservices in the future? That's for you to decide. <clears throat> There's a lot of tools. You may have seen this on the internet. I just grabbed it and put it here, but this is a periodic table of DevOps tools. DevOps framework fits really nicely into a microservices architecture. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there, right? A lot of those are open source tools. And then, of course, we have SUSE and friends. <laughs> um, we have things like SUSE Studio, Cloud Foundry, uh, Kiwi. Um, so SUSE Studio, you can take a look at that yourself, SUSEstudio.com. Um, that is the uh, web-based version of Kiwi. Um, Kiwi is the command line interface to that. It, it will give you that ability to kind of point and click and choose what you want to be able to um, carve up your own little operating system and add some code to it and turn it into an image that can be launched anywhere that you'd like, either a public cloud, private cloud, in your data center with an ISO image. Um, on virtualized environments such as VMware, KVM, or Zen. Uh, we have SUSE Manager, which is now being integrated with SaltStack. And uh, we had a nice introduction to SaltStack this morning from the keynote. Um, you're going to learn lots more about that this week. Um, there are several sessions that talk about SaltStack, and we'll continue to talk about that uh, this week. Um, also, the Open Build Service, um, an awesome tool that you can use to actually compile your own code. It does plug into Git, um, both GitLab and GitHub, I believe. Yeah, um, pretty sure GitLab as well. And uh, will allow you to uh, build your software into an RPM base or other Linux distributions as well. Um, and then you can use that to automate that process uh, into a microservices architecture. Automate your application, launching that into containers um, and then, of course, Docker. We've got some sessions this week on Docker. SUSE Enterprise Storage as a storage framework uh, behind your, your infrastructure. Kubernetes, I know uh, Federica has talked about that uh, just earlier today. Um, this is a de deployment framework. It's a, it's a layer underneath that you can uh, run your microservices architecture on top of. Um, Here's a listing of some of the sessions that you might want to take a look at this week. Um, and also some URLs at the bottom. It might be kind of small. Something that's new is developer.susa.com. Right now it just redirects to a blog, but the site is coming soon. It'll probably be another couple of weeks before the site is actually out there. But you're going to find lots of great information about how to get started with developing on top of SUSE Linux Enterprise. Um, do you have anything else to add? I would say that you listed pretty much everything that is going on this week. But nevertheless, I mean, um, we from the container side, then I'm pretty sure that also the public cloud guys, the cloud foundry guys, I mean, we're all in the touch showcase. So if you have questions, if you have ideas, just come to us and just let's have a chat. So we're going to be around here the entire time. So please feel free to drop by and, you know, any kind of question we are going to be available there in case you don't want to ask that specifically now. And we'll take questions right now if you have any questions. And if there's no questions, that's, we're done.
turn this off. Oh, I did. Are you based in India? Yeah. So, I, do you know the. Um, this is a. Okay. Yeah, so probably, they'll have access to these. Yeah. Okay. They're also. All of these are all also being recorded. So, you, you may even just be able to show the presentation. No, no, show the video. Yeah, so the reason is I like the way it sounds in the microphone. I have gone through the Martin Paul's. Uh, Okay. Yep. It's a just pick up, but the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, interesting topic, right? It just seems like a lot of effort, but I'm but I'm the older crusty. All right, things are pearl still, right? <laughs> Sorry? So she said, no, they're just, they're just pipes. Yeah, it is. It's just really scrappy pipes. It's pipes. It's pipes. Wow, it's yeah. And yeah. who needs big data, right? You yeah. can run a bunch of yeah, in line yeah. editing commands yeah. and you're done. That's, well, that's, no. why, that's why Perl, right? <laughs> that's right. Once you, you, once you get to, your to, your to four pipes, and it's time to run a Perl program. I think you made us yeah. the Thank you very much. Yeah, I actually did the right guy. Some of our hard time when you're on the show. I like the show. It was great. But what you're telling me is to use microservices correctly after you're really organized. The biggest problem I have right now is ain't nobody organized. Yeah. Nobody. So, yes, if I am a multi billion dollar company, absolutely. Or you're, or you're a brand new company. We know. Um, that's actually, you know what? I, I realized that if I were a large company and I was going, now we're going to look at an active acquisition, if you were using container solutions, I would absolutely be part of that list. Um, and they're probably needing to do something up there, you got it working, you put it together, and nobody knows how to do it. Um, I saw that when uh, oh, the Bell acquired somebody and HP acquired somebody. Both of them had the same time. I was like, no, we're going to have to. And they're just like, yeah, we're going to have to. They're going to Well, yeah, well, a, a acquiring a company um, usually means you're trying to acquire the people, but you can't tie the people down there. Um, yeah, in this case, in this case, it's not good. It's 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 the job for the twenty first century. Actually, the standardization of Java is like I will and I'll carry any banner between all Java and the containers. They are garbage, blow all of my systems, I don't want them to be for the rest of them. I'm like, hey, Java is GPM, let's put it on the container. But the but the promise the promise the promise for Java was that you know if you write it once it'll be it's hundred percent portable, it runs yeah, everywhere, right. it's brilliant. And then right. and then you have versions of JRE and, and Great. It's exactly what you just described. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. actually, yeah. here's the first time I've seen that we actually provide some microservices, which is made by the ICPS. I looked at it and that's all it is. Yeah. So, it's not magic. It is. The thing is, if you go to the data from the same collection, it's just a matter of someone else has a piece of paper that everything needs to be done. That's maybe a piece of the problem. So I was, I was actually looking at, you know, I grew up doing bad things, working at the time of all the things. So I was building all this stuff, and I started looking at the way people were doing it, and we're, we're literally turning around and just pointing them on like, creating some melody lines with deep value. We're creating, um, uh, you know, the 
You're, you're over 30, right? I am fairly over. Yeah, so you, I, gotta, I gotta retire now. It's, uh, once, once you hit, once you hit over 30, then you suddenly realise that all these young people are doing some stupid <laughs> things, <laughs> and they're just repeating the old mistakes. Right? <laughs> and then when you hit 40, you, you realise the 30 year olds don't know what they're talking about either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> It's called a grill, grey beard. That's right. Um, so constrain some. I don't think it's going to happen until people in the US anybody else will find a file. Sorry, a public file? You know that they own it. Because, because more there are some organizations that do real that have some really strict IP. Are you, are you familiar with Portis? Okay, so Portis is, is a project that we introduced in 12. Basically, I mean, one of the, one of the big you know, uh, draw cards that the, the Docker people are, are into. Oh, you can, you can. You can just use your uh, you uh, use your use your registry. You can grid anything and just drag it down. Yeah. So nice idea showing you that around Facebook. Hey, where the hell is this data coming from? Like you say, it's like I'm running some code. I don't know what it does. It just does that. The concept's nice, you know, being able to share things around. What Portis lets you do is basically um, privatize that. So you can you can take advantage of that kind of concept of like organization. And not let you dead out into the wild west. This is this is the container from the world. I mean, that also that also more like this is awesome. The containers got created and all that. Containers are designed to make them and ops to be the one that just goes. Where ops are going, I made your stuff go. I turned it off because it broke. But I just turned it off. Um, that is the more organization we go to, it's supposed to be unifying things. It's an absolute way to be that absolutely. Well, I think I think well, a, I think it's an, I think it's an attempt by developers to take over ops. You know what they don't like though? They don't like SLAs. They don't like waking up at three and go fix a crap. As a beer, you're absolutely right. They're, they're trying to take that. Oh, it works on my laptop. Oh, uh, now I now how do I how do I just ship that onto onto the, the servers? Oh, well, I'll just invent a framework that lets me do that. That I reckon that's great. And then the developer now comes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's, the, that's the problem. The minute you slap the developer team, you can mess on it. You can get them to run the files. They start running away crazy. No, 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 it's the ops team. Yeah, table. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's not here because the developer don't want to follow us. They don't want to follow us because we don't want to follow regulations. And the ops team. I'm saying that those that detail work. So, for example, we started. We don't have billions of dollars when we do it, we yeah. are but we are German. <laughs> no, no, so just, let me, give, just let me give an example. So, uh, obviously, with Exclusive, there is not much microservices going on. But we're still using microservices for example, with some terms. So, once it's possible for Kotlin, then it's And actually, got their own way. So, actually, they are on call. So, those yeah. guys, the yeah. developers are on call. At this point, you, know, you guys are on call. And they you know, they know, quit on you. Um, yes. Right now, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and again, I've been to so many places, but the minute you, the developers are doing it, and they're doing it with And the minute you put them to something like, you like, not want to be out of your responsibility, you just follow up. We definitely cannot that at the top of their own responsibility. It's not going to be as expected as that. That's never going to work. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just interesting. You guys had a much more. Out. Realistic yeah. approach. That's good feedback. <laughs> well, it's always nice to hear that, right? <laughs> You're pessimistic. <laughs> well, no, I mean, honestly, you didn't, you didn't come in and share with it. You know, this was a problem. You came in and said, oh, I've got it. Sure. 
but that, but the, the unfortunate, yeah. the unfortunate thing is that you know this, this whole concept of life services is that you've got to have to deal with it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the associates educating the health and stuff. And how can you deal with it? And, you know, we've got some bits and pieces that might be able to help. But it's still very much attached. We so, realise yeah. that there will continue to be a the new tools you know, that, yeah, sure, that, that are going to be created.
They're just bouncing around. Just don't forget to wear the microphone. I work uh, in the research with Christophe Ledovsky Tony, and you are one of the important people to <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs>
Okay. So, welcome to the last session of today. Um, I think that we are ready to kick off the creativity, right? That was the session <laughs> name. Um, my name is Simona Arsene. I work in product management. Um, and I'm really happy to, 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 to be here today. And actually, I had to change the slide deck that was initially planned for the session in order to present you the new idea that we have in the area of just enough operating system to kick off creativity. Um, I, I think that the microphone works, right? And you can all hear me perfectly. Yeah. Like this? OK. Good. So um, it was last year at SUSECON um, when we announced um, the availability of uh, JUICE, uh, as we call it, or just enough operating system. And back then, the back then we said that um, what, is very, what is important for us is to make sure that whatever we ship as a minimal operating system, it, it, it inherits all the benefits of SLES. So that means customers don't need to recertify. That means that all the extensions and modules are available for this uh, new version of SLES. And on top of this, we really wanted to go on the journey of making everything as small as possible. And this has, has triggered a lot of um, um, challenges for the engineering team in order to make sure that they put on, on juice what is really relevant and essential for the operating system and nothing more. And I think that we did a nice, we, did, we made a nice journey and we, we managed to accomplish that um, the current juice that was released in, um, in November and then um, has seen refreshes in April and uh, during the summer, so in July. And very soon we'll see, we'll see another refresh for SP2 um, inherits all the benefits of SLES. So there is no need to recertify SLES. There is no need. You have all the um, you have all the extensions and modules. You really have a minimal virtual images that is ready for you to use it. It's, it's easy to download it and just get it started as soon as possible. Um, the other part that we managed. Um, to, to deliver is the template. So you are able to rebuild Juice on your own, as well as you are able to add additional packages on Juice as you, as you need it. So uh, Juice sounds cool, right? Sounds everything that you ever needed, everything that's, um, that was there for many, many years. So why are we having a talk here? Why don't we just go all download the, the image and just go ahead and see what's, what's, what's in there? Um, I'm going to explain that in a second. But before we go forward, there is another concept that is important in the area of the minimal um, um, operating system. And that was introduced in Lead 12. And it continued to, to work on, on this concept. But that's the idea of modules. So what we have done over the last couple of years is we tried to mix together the requirement that we have from one, one set of customers, which was to always maintain something for a long period of time, sometimes even five years, seven years, 10 years, and so on, with the requirement of other customers that are going into the direction of, I want to get the latest and greatest, otherwise this is not relevant for my infrastructure. And we always try to balance that. And we came in front of you many times telling you, no, we, did, we decided for this version of PHP, we decided for this other version here and there, because we think that this is the version that is going to be long-term supported, and that's the version that your operation and development team should consider using. With Lead 12, we tried to do a different, um, or, or we, we tried a different solution that it's actually working very nicely at the moment. And that is the concept of modules. So what we did is we, we isolated the, the, the part of the operating system that they call base operating system. Um, and that is sometimes, uh, that's not necessarily choose, that, that can be larger, that's, that, that can be bigger than choose. But the, the bottom line is this is the part of SLES that we currently ship as, as SLES. And then everything else that had a different life cycle or a specific use case or any subset of packages that could have been encapsulated and shipped as a separate repository was, done, was encapsulated into a module. At the moment, we have um, a set of modules that um, address different needs like uh, web and scripting that are going after developers, definitely shipping there all the latest technologies. We have modules in the area of public cloud, as well as modules like legacy, uh, where we have the, um, the packages that we plan to drop, but they are still going to be there until we see that there is no need for those packages. And of course, we have new modules like containers or certifications that are helping us um, manage the, the innovation in this area. 
So back a little bit to Jews, when he talked about, uh, about Jews, he said that it inherits everything. Jews inherits all those modules. So if you want to start something today, you can actually give it a try to Jews as a minimal image, then add the modules that you need on top of that, and you can have a very um, functional operating system that is ready for you to, um, to use and deploy everything. Now, when you talk about who is going to use this, well, we usually end up in these scenarios like DevOps. And when we look like at the reality check for DevOps, we see this, um, and I found this very nice picture that really helps me um, articulate my idea. So when developers talk about DevOps, they mainly talk about Docker, right? So they talk about containers, their technologies, you, ha you learn Docker, you actually now do DevOps. It's easy, it's there, it's, 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 it's simple. So the learning curve for this, it's really, it, it, it's something that is manageable for most of the organization. When DevOps looks into operation, there are actually multiple layers on top of Docker. So of course the operational team needs to learn, needs to learn about Docker, that's, uh, that's going without saying. But then they need to learn about Kubernetes and how to handle the network and how to do the, the rolling de deployments and the monitoring and the, 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 log, the system logging and, and everything else. And that becomes a problem because you can see the adoption of DevOps, it's going to be easier in the development part on the development part of the slide and much more challenging much more challenging on the operational slide, side of, of, of this slide. And this is where at least the, the, the goal of this session has slightly changed. And as we want now to introduce a new platform that will actually help the operation teams deliver the solution and have this available for their internal customers. And we currently call this SUSE Container as a Service Platform. And this <clears throat> has uh, the following priorities or use cases. So we are going to look at develop as, as providing something that where customers can, can, can manage their workloads uh, cross environment. So it doesn't matter if you are running your application in your data center or if you're running your application in your data center in the cloud or you need to do a mixed environment, this solution is going to help you scale out your application. And we are going to make sure that we move from the idea of um, Things have to run on one machine, even if it's my laptop or my server or so on, to the idea that things have to run in a cluster, where, thing, where the whole situation becomes much more complex because you no longer know exactly where your application is running and what is happening in that um, situation in that, in that cluster. So, so the whole, the core, um, concept of this is oops, that we are going to glue together or put together three main components. The first one is the SLE micro OS. The second one is Kubernetes. And the third one is Docker. Now, let's look a little bit what this really means. So the, the SLE micro OS, this is a new type of operating system that we are going to build and ship. And we are going to talk about the, the time frame in a second. And this is really targeted for cluster deployments in a, in, a, in, a, in a world or in an environment where everything is container. So when you think about micro as you have to think in a, in a data center where containers are already there, where the mindset of developers are all around Docker and how cool Docker is and how cool containers are. And in that environment, we need to, to look at a different type of operating system that is going to, to fulfill and facilitate this, um, this, uh, this deployment and solution. The second part is Kubernetes, and this is a well-known open source orchestration solution, and we are going to, con to work upstream on the Kubernetes. We are going to always go with the latest version of Kubernetes. This will help us manage the, the different use cases in the area of orchestration. So how do you manage multiple containers? How do you handle the workloads between different containers? And of course, when you talk about containers, we need to talk about Docker. So in the area of... Um, what is a micro OS? So we want to build a modern operating system that is really designed for containers and have in mind the idea of large deployments and large clusters. And micro OS will definitely inherit all the knowledge from SLES as well as all the benefits that SLES brings uh, while redefining the, 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 and the uh, operating system. Why should we look at this? <clears throat> I already mentioned DevOps, and that's one of the important use cases. Most of you are already facing the situation where 
<clears throat> in many, many accounts or in many uh, discussions, you know that DevOps sounds very good for developers, but it's really challenging for operation. And with this product, we really want to go and help the operational teams and praise the DevOps and have a solution that really fulfills their, uh, their scenario. The second part is this will definitely accelerate the business innovation. So now, finally, customers will be able to easily deploy their application, to easily change setups, and as well as manage the scalability of applications when needed. We bring on top of this the enterprise um, flag. So we are not going to just do things in a startup way. We do it and then it crashes and then you, you have a critical situation. We are going to make sure that everything is ready, it's stable, it comes with an enterprise support solution. And this will allow you to run your applications anywhere you are and scale out as, as, as much as you can. So what problems are we trying to, to solve? Um, Today, uh, there, are, there, are, there are many customers that are... Uh, so, when you look at the operating system, when you look at SLES today, this is a monolithic operating system that has multiple use cases, that fulfills the need of multiple, uh, in multiple scenarios, and it's seen as a stable enterprise-ready solution that uh, enables you to, to run your applications to and enable you to run your application across multiple um, life cycles and so on. However, when containers came in, we realized that SLES has become too big for a container. It has it, this multiple purpose operating system, which has been and continues to be one of the key benefits of SLES, has now become one of the impediments when you look at containers. And this, has, this is a, a, a situation that is identified by SUSE as well as other vendors when you look at how containers are going for. So, in this context, we really want to make sure that we have a small, ready-to-use operating system that is targeted for containers and is focused on this type of deployment. And if we go a little bit deeper into what exactly will microOS include, um, so the, our plans are to really look at the installation and make sure that we have a, a small and uh, ready-to-use um, image that is going to be deployed on bare metal. So that means you can have the solution available on physical hardware and, and you can start with that when you look at your deployment. Um, the second is we are going to um, de deliver virtual images for micro as, as we do today for, for those. So you will be able to get virtual images or micro as if you are running in this on top of virtual environment in the public cloud and so on. And the third is um, we'll make sure that um, uh, the configuration, it's, uh, it's made as easy as possible. So there are different solutions that we are evaluating at the moment. Uh, we are definitely going to take advantage of the salt stack that will help us to manage the configurations and get everything aligned as well as have a smooth integration with SUSE Manager. In terms of scalability, we really assume that you are going to use this scenario for more than 25 nodes. Of course, you want to give it a try on a, on a machine or on a, on a development setup, but you, if this is interesting for you if you have more than 25 nodes. And if you have more than 200 nodes, that it becomes even more interesting. In terms of updates, we are introducing a couple of interesting and really cool concepts. So first of all, we are introducing the concept of a transactional update. That so far we have shipped our updates as RPM. So there are individual small updates and packages that we ship into our, into our update repository. Now we are going to make sure that we collect all the, those uh, updates into one update that is going to be applied as a transactional update to the system. So once the update is, is into the system, the update will automatically be applied to the system. If there are problems with this update, then the system will have the capability to roll back to a stable from, to a stable um, state. So with this, what we actually introduce is a self-updatable um, operating system that will not only have the functionality of always go to the latest version, but as well as if there are problems, go back to a stable version and do not affect my infrastructure. This functionality is going to be implemented using core functionalities of ButterFS. So we are going to look into the system rollback and snapshot that we have already introduced and advertised during the last couple of years in ButterFS. We know that not all of you are, are able to trust a self-updatable operating system. So some of you will say, that's way too much for me. I need something 
where I can still have the control. It's hard to just let it go. It's hard to let the, the gear go and say now uh, everything is going to be safe, uh, self-updated. But So for that, we are going to introduce the concept of a maintenance window, a time frame where we are, can say during this, during uh, let's say midnight and 1 a.m. or something like this, do this update. And if it's out of this, then roll back to a stable version. Or um, if we cannot make it into that period, it's just will not make the, the, the update because it's critical for my for my infrastructure that everything it's uh, it's available for my applications. So, are those ideas kind of clear? Do you have any questions so far? Yeah. So we are planning to update the operating system that on top of which the containers are running. So we, we will have a stack. We'll have the container host operating system, and this is going to go into the auto update cycle. Then we will have Kubernetes, which current where we have the plan to have rolling updates. That means a new update of once a new update of Kubernetes is going to come, you're just going to um, naturally go to the latest. And then containers are on top of this infrastructure. Yes, <laughs> um, And that's a natural question, right? So, just as a general purpose operating system, that means you can use just in any environment. You can use it with containers, you can use it with virtual machines, and soon you're actually going to be able to use it on the installation as well. And Juice comes with all those less benefits. You, can, you have all the extensions, all the modules, so you can put high availability on top of Juice. You can put all the um, modules that I just talked about, like web and scripting, legacies, uh, containers, and everything It's available for you. Um, it, um, it has this mindset that it's just a stripped down version of Slash, right? So it's just something that as small as, you know, you give it a try, and then on top of this, you can just put additional packages as you want. So if you miss one of the packages from the juice distribution that we ship, you can easily build in, have it in, and then you get into that. As well as with juice, it's very easy to, to move directly to full Slash. So you can give it a try to juice saying, well, this is not really working for me. I want the full Slash. You can just very easy update from Juice to a full SLES distribution. MicroOS is mainly container focused. So we, we really look at MicroOS as the container host operating system. If you are outside of the container world, MicroOS is not important for you, not even relevant at the moment. So if you are not interested in Kubernetes and running a, a container as a service platform and this container is not something that you are interested in, then MicroOS is not, not a solution for you. If you are interested, then you have to, to, to decide what is more, more relevant for you. So it might be that you just want to run static containers, right? So you just want to have a couple of containers that are running on top of a virtual ma machine and so on. And there, even, mic even their microwaves might not be relevant for you. But if you want to go the full stack with containers, that means your entire application now runs only on containers. For that, you need a container or orchestration, which most likely is going to be Kubernetes. And that needs to run on top of something, and that something is microOS. So that is the transition from a general purpose operating system that has a favor or that has an, an additional layer, which is like juice or something smaller that you can start, to a focused operating system that it's only designed for containers, large scalability, where we really think that you know manual intervention and so on is not something that you will ever want to do. It's a transition, so. <laughs> yeah? Do you want to take it, Thursday? No. Technology, but currently we don't have it. 
if you are as customer demands, if you are in front of the development, maybe we can go online, or if you want to be in our building, you should have to get the person to decide to discuss as customer, which is what the market needs to play, or can be better for me. If you want, I can demonstrate to you that for this is your PS1 and 4S. So, in terms of, and we already touched some of those points, um, in terms of what is different on this, so um, I think that I, we mentioned already, so ButterFS is going to be the default file system and we are going to use core functionalities of ButterFS um, to make sure that we, we can handle the transactional updates. Um, the second part is we are going to continue to use RPMs. Um, there are vendors out there who decided to drop RPMs. Um, this is not our decision, so we'll continue to use RPMs and we need these solutions in order to make sure that the, the transactional updates are in good shape, they are signed, they are verified. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We are going to use our build infrastructure um, to make sure that this is properly built and you can all rely on that. And of course, the security certifications, um, we are going to ensure that they are kept and they are, they are, um, um, they are available for you on microOS. The other part, um, this is more important if you are already familiar with um, the other vendors that are out there. Uh, very important for the microOS as one of the differentiators compared to the other vendors is that we already have a partner ecosystem. We have ISV certifications um, that we plan to maintain as well as we have a set of partners that are willing to work with us on making this available, things that you might miss on other distributions. Um, in terms of the schedule, um, so we, we are now publicly talking about this. Uh, we, we encourage you to visit the kiosk as well as just you know grab us and talk about this if you are interested more in the solution. Uh, we will have in uh, March um, an early access program or a public beta where you can just join the program to see the, to have access to the software, test it and see how it works for you. And we plan to have a first customer shipment of this new platform somewhere in July 2017. So the bottom line is this is really coming, and we are quite excited about having um, a, a platform as a service solution um, available to give it to give it actually to you to give it a try to see if it makes sense for you to see how it works to see how we can make actually the transition from the classical data center into a containerized data center where containers are actually re, uh, running everywhere, and hopefully that will help you even with the multiple vendors where you have. Uh, solutions in-house as well as public or you, you are using public cloud and other solutions. Those are all my slides. Um, I'm just curious if there are questions or which are your thoughts, what do you think about this? If this is relevant in any in any way. You need a, a solution, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. So Thorsten um, is the um, architect for uh, for microOS, and he has already, as he mentioned, he can show you the microOS at the boot, um, as well as you can. We would like to keep in touch if you are interested. Uh, so we have now a, a public mailing list. You can subscribe, and we are going to inform you about what's happening and what's coming up next. Yeah, so we see more this as a, as a platform that is going to be used either by customers that are just trying out DevOps or are just trying to figure out how things should work in their data center, um, as well as small installations or medium to medium to not necessarily small, small instead of containers, so medium size installations. When you talk about OpenStack, OpenStack it's a, it's a project that requires a large deployment as well as training and learning for that. That is an investment from the organization. And the way we see is that this can be a first step and then you can actually upgrade to the full OpenStack that brings much more benefits than, than this um, uh, stripped down platform. Mm -hmm. 
let me just go back no stop stop here sorry um, so that the idea of that graphic is that um, a micro S plus Kubernetes is going to help you manage everything that was on top of Docker, from the, uh, from the networking to the security to the log management, monitoring, and so on. There's going to be either Kubernetes alone or additional modules that are coming on top of Kubernetes, like additional add-ons, as Kubernetes calls them. Yeah, Kubernetes comes comes with additional add-ons. Um, as far as I know, for example, the monitoring, it's an add-on on top of Kubernetes. And we, we have the plans to ship all those add-ons available for you. It's just that from a migration perspective or an update perspective, you'll have to update your core Kubernetes installation and then the add-ons will going to come with their own, um, or the, the, yeah, the add-ons are going to come with their own updates set up. Uh, right, and that's why we are we are actually going to or well, we are planning to use salt to deploy the micro OS and and deploy Kubernetes on top of micro OS. So that's our plan as well. But then the problem is how do you manage everything that is going on top like containers? Your application is going to now be available as different set of containers, right? But you might have uh, this in like 10, 15 containers and then you need to manage everything. And this is the part where Kubernetes comes into place. So what's the main um, thinking of, of having transactional updates or still keeping Zipper in? Or? Well, is, it, is it still up here? So I can answer what it solves. So the problem that we are trying to solve is to make sure that we can do the auto-update on the system and roll back in case of, uh, of, a, of a failure. So we need to make sure that we don't do, we don't update the system multiple times per day, and we always can run into a, 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 a to unfortunate situation of something is not working or a dependency is not there and so on. But we make sure that we build everything together. We test this as a transactional update. If this works, then you actually go apply this to the system, and only in the you know unlikely event something is, is wrong, then the system is able to roll back to a stable version. Um, the RPM, Dorsten, you want to jump in? So the main thing like the different updates is if you have only one update like a and you can use the analysis. If you want to make a bigger form of this, then you can have to do the open and under the for example, by updating the traceability version where you can do the article with the computer or whatever. If you look at the running system, you're running, you can get an update to buy. And this is something you want to avoid. So, in terms of the update, it does not feel in fact connect to the running services. If something goes wrong during this update, you can delete it, and the system is still in the clear state, and there's no uh, leftover from the current update. And uh, 
Any other question or comment? If not, then thank you very much for joining and hope you want to hear more about this.